Good morning, everyone. Welcome along to Curious About Our Planet, a live and online digital festival here at Glasgow Science Centre. We are here for the third and final day of this festival, and it's a very exciting session you're joining us for today. We are going to be heading over to the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland, Edinburgh Zoo, and we're going to be talking with Blair from Penguins Rock, the penguin enclosure. Now, we are going to start with a short video before we head over to meet Blair virtually. And we're going to be asking Blair your questions. So please, we are expecting a very busy session today. So good morning to everyone who's joined us already. If you are with us live on Friday morning, please send all your questions through to us via We'll ask Blair as many as we possibly can. For just now, please enjoy the short presentation on the penguins and we will be joining up with Blair very soon. Hi everyone and welcome to Penguins Rock here at Edinburgh Zoo. So I'm joined by Dawn who's one of our penguin wranglers here at the zoo. So we've got three magnificent species here. So tell us a little bit about them, where we might find them out in the wild. Yeah, so we actually have quite a large colony here at Edinburgh. We have our gentoo penguins, so those are medium-sized birds. And they're quite distinctive. They have this white band that goes across the top of their head. We have our smaller species, our northern rock hoppers, which have this yellow crest coming out the top of the head, much tinier species. And then we have our large species, which are called our king penguins, They're very similar to emperors. Now, something you'd find in common with these species, they're all subantarctic. So you'd find them in areas like the Falkland Islands and for a little species like the rock hoppers in places like Tristan da Cunha and the Gough Islands. And here at Edinburgh Zoo, we're really lucky. We have this fantastic outdoor enclosure. It's one of the largest outdoor enclosures in the whole of Europe. And you can see the great big pool behind us, about 1.2 million litres of water. And for looking after these guys, how do you look after such a big enclosure with so many animals? <laughs> with a lot of work and a lot of patience. Um, yeah, so our day, we have, there's normally a team of at least two or three of us that are working just with our penguins on a daily basis. Um, and as you can imagine, a lot of that involves feeding. We actually hand feed our penguins here at Edinburgh. Now this is partly down to the fact we've got three different species um, and the northern rock hoppers get a different fish from the gentoos and the kings um, but it's also because of the number of birds that we have so if we were to just go along and throw all their fish into the pool it'd be really difficult for us to be able to tell which birds are eating and which aren't. Now all their birds are actually um, identifiable because they've got um, flipper bands on so males are on the right hand side, females are on the left hand side and they're also colour coordinated depending on who that individual is. So we can look at those colour bands and we know exactly which bird that is. Um, and the rest of the day, as I'm sure many of you are probably aware, involves cleaning. So there's a lot of cleaning that's involved when we're looking after a penguin wow. colony, especially someone of this size. And what about our ever important knighted penguin? <laughs> so who is this and how do you tell them apart from the rest? Yeah, so we have, I mentioned our five king penguins earlier. And one of those king penguins is particularly important um, because that's because he's actually um, a knighted penguin. So his uh, full title is actually, actually Brigadier Sir Niels Olaf, Colonel in Chief of the Norwegian Military Guard of Norway and the King's Guard. Now this um, started back in the 80s where they were over for the military tattoo. And when they come to visit the uh, penguins here at Edinburgh, they love the king penguins that much. They decided to invite one of those king penguins to be their mascot for their King's Guard. And this has progressed throughout the years um, to the point where uh, a few years ago he was actually made a uh, brigadier and he was also made Baron of Bouvie Island. So he's not only got a title, but he also has land as well. So why do we have penguins here at the zoo? What sort of threats are they facing out in the wild? Yeah, so unfortunately, like many other animals, um, there is a lot of issues that they're having to try and battle against and compete against out in the wild. And for penguins, um, the fishing trade is having a big impact, so that's us sending our ships and taking out tons and tons of different fish um, at a time. And unfortunately, it's leaving very little um, for our colony, uh, for the colonies out there. And one particular species this has had a massive impact on is our northern rock hoppers. Our northern rock hoppers are a uh, class as an endangered species. They were given this listing in 2008. There is less than half a million of them now left out in the wild. Overfishing has really had a massive impact. And quite simply, it means that the parents who are on these islands trying to breed and rear their chicks, there's just not enough fish left in the water for them. 
Now, there has been big, massive changes. Um, the Tristan de Cunha government have actually now banned fishing in and around the green season for this species. And we're also part of a research project out there looking at the dispersal of the different species. And here at the zoo, we do a lot of research with our birds as well. We look into um, even just simple things like how much vitamin supplements do they need? What kind of fish do they need? And this could all be then fed back to the conservation of the species out in the wild. And hopefully one day we'll be able to see those numbers increase again. Excellent stuff. Welcome back. And I hope you enjoyed that short introduction to the penguins. We are now online with Blair over at the zoo. So good morning, Blair. How are you? Good morning. I'm very well. Thank you for joining us here today. Um, we oh, are no, thank you for joining. <laughs> We're coming live <laughs> from uh, Edinburgh Zoo's Penguin Rock on a, uh, well, it was actually grey sky day, but it's, the blue skies are coming out. It's looking like it's going to turn out to be a gorgeous one. Uh, and I'm here to answer any of your questions with our beautiful penguins here at Edinburgh Zoo's Penguin Rock uh, today. So, um, Let's crack on with some questions, guys. If you've got any more, yeah. of course, put them into YouTube and uh, we'll go through them. So we do have quite a lot coming in already and we do have a lot of schools with us today. So good morning, all. So the first question being, can you tell us a bit about how climate change is affecting or could affect the population of penguins? Well, absolutely. Now, um, what we have to remember is that there's more than just one type of penguin in the world. Uh, there's some 18 species of penguins scattered around the southern hemisphere. Some of them live on the ice caps. So down in Antarctica, you get animals like the emperor penguin, the Adelie penguin, and these are animals who live and breed on the Antarctic ice. Now, as of with global warming happening, just as we see the Arctic ice threatening polar bears, there's huge ramifications for these Antarctic penguins, like the emperor and the Adelie penguins, when that ice sheet melts. Now, the penguins we hold here at Edinburgh Zoo, though, <clears throat> you might think it's a bit tropical with our blue skies for our penguins. In fact, these guys are from the Falkland Islands and a few other islands around the southern uh, Atlantic Ocean. What you'll find is that our Gen 2 penguins, they don't necessarily breed on ice sheets, they actually are found on cold, wet, windy islands in the South Atlantic Ocean. Just like we here in Edinburgh are in a cold, wet, windy island in the North Atlantic Ocean. We're a fantastic climate for them. So theoretically, they should do fine. But in the wild, as we know, global warming is seeing ice caps melting, which is affecting the salinity, the saltiness of the water. It's seeing the water become warmer. And one of our issues in terms of researching out in the South Atlantic Ocean is so much of it is happening beneath the surface. And it's very hard to tell how that increase, uh, that decrease in salinity with all that meltwater from the ice caps coming in and how the increase in temperature is affecting the ecosystem. These are predators. Penguins eat fish. Gentoos particularly love squid. Rockhoppers love krill. We're home to three species, as the video showed you. Each has a different uh, species they prefer to eat, but they're predators. And if their species that they are eating are disappearing because of an increase in temperature or a change in the saltiness of the water. Without their food sources, these guys might be uh, starting to struggle in the future. So that's one of the main issues that penguins are facing. It's probably what's happening with their food sources rather than just the melting ice caps because not all penguins live on the ice. All of them live in the sea though, and that's being hugely affected by global warming. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Um, a few of the penguins were making themselves known there in the background. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're a well, noisy bunch. Yeah, excellent. But that's what we like to see and hear. Um, yeah, excellent stuff. We have, as I said, quite a few questions, so we'll get on with them. This is um, from Niall, um, primary five, six at Loch Ardell. How long do the species of penguins in Edinburgh Zoo live? So... Penguins, uh, much like most zoo animals, tend to live a little bit long, longer in captivity. Uh, here they've got fantastic vet care, we look after all of their needs. Um, so they tend to live a bit longer in captivity in the zoo than they would in the wild. But otherwise, life expectancy wise, uh, you'll see that our Gen 2s get around about 30. Um, our rock hoppers, a couple of them have got up to 35 in the last couple of years. Um, 
And actually, our king penguins, although our king penguins aren't quite that old, uh, there's one recorded up in its 40s. So these are quite long-lived birds. Um, so when they're born here every year at Edinburgh Zoo, they'll be with us for quite some time. Uh, as I say, we've got a few of them in their 30s just now. So they're, uh, they're older than I am, um, which I like to think isn't saying much, but um, every year it becomes more dramatic a statement. Um, anyways, yeah. Yeah, I think I would be considered quite an old king penguin at my age, actually. But I wouldn't I would say too much else. Um, and certainly the videos showed us how you um, hand feed them as well. So they're certainly well cared for by yourselves. Yeah, absolutely. You might be able to see one of our keepers in the background as I'm chatting. She's actually just going along hand feeding this morning. It's, oh. it's a big job uh, with oh, over 100 I can penguins. There's a oh, it's it's a thankless task. Yeah. You can imagine how how sorry she feels for herself feeding penguins all morning. Um, oh. It's pretty nice. Um, anyway, sorry. Next question. No, actually, the next question um, is still to do with feeding the penguins. It's from Kelvin Side Academy, and they're asking how much does a penguin need to eat in a day, and that's from Henry. So um, our penguins are pretty much predominantly fed fish here in the zoo um, on the most part um, and essentially they'll be fed about three times a day three or four times a day and they'll make sure that every penguin's getting at least a fish so we're looking at multiple fish each day for every penguin 365 days a year um, and that adds up to an awful lot of fish that uh, we're actually required to bring into the zoo just to make sure that our animals have the right diet so that they're living long healthy lives and can really start help to conserve these animals, produce the next generation in, uh, in our zoo. Because by allowing them to live in the zoo, we can breed them and we can get baby penguins so that we get more of these penguins alive and well, safe from the threats that they might be facing in the wild. So um, yeah, that's our penguins with their feeding. Excellent. We get a wee bit of breeding there. <laughs> oh, there we go. Absolutely essential work as well that you're doing there. Um, again, we have another question from YouTube through Miss McDonald. This is from Isla. I know you have three different species in the zoo, but how many different types of penguins are there? So there's about 18 different species in the in the world. There's a wee bit of contention. Um, sometimes the geneticists look at populations and split them. Uh, what was formerly just rockhoppers is now northern and southern rockhoppers. So we hold northern rockhoppers here at Edinburgh Zoo. Um, but there's around about 18 different species and they're all from different ecosystems. Um, so yes, you get ones in Antarctica, but we shouldn't forget that there's also uh, penguins living in Australia, New Zealand. You get penguins in Africa. You get penguins in quite, uh, quite tropical locations. You get penguins on the Galapagos Islands. So really penguins can be found in different environments, but they're always found by the sea and penguins are always found in the Southern Hemisphere, so south of the equator. And I think it's important you mentioned ecosystems there. In, in previous sessions, we have spoken about, you know, we're all connected and we're all linked. So if one part of the ecosystem is affected by climate change, then it's it's going to affect us all. Absolutely. We used to speak about, you know, the seven seas out there. But really, when we're talking about uh, the ocean, it is one ocean. If you put plastic in the ocean off the coast of Scotland, it's all connected. That piece of plastic can flow anywhere in the world. And plastic pollution is one of the big threats to these animals as well. So um, one ocean, it's not just one little pocket being affected. When we get one part wrong, the whole system around the world can get uh, go wrong too. Excuse me. Oh, excellent, thanks for covering that for us. Um, we have a question here from Sharon. How many penguins live at Edinburgh Zoo? <laughs> Good question. Now, <clears throat> every year uh, come Easter, we get a little boost. Uh, that's their breeding season. So. Um, Every year, our Gen 2s, around about Christmas time, start flirting with each other. Penguins flirt by uh, bowing to their partners for the Gen 2 penguins. They make a little hiss as they come back up. When I do it, it's not very attractive. But when the penguin does it, it's adorable. The boys also pick up pebbles and give it to their females. And that means that every year, we get a little boost to our population, uh, maybe about 10 to 20 uh, Gen 2 chicks. And that's because right now, the Gen 2 penguins that we see here, who have this white stripe across the top of their head, We've got over 100 Gen 2 penguins in the population. The smaller rockhoppers, they're just on the far side just now. They're the most endangered type of penguin we have. There's actually a wee cutout of it here. I wonder if I, it's quite, there we go. There's a wee cutout of our rockhopper. Uh, we've got about 20 rockhoppers and just the five king penguins. Uh, we've got another couple of cutouts here. So there's our Gen 2. And that's what our king penguins would look like with the yellow by their 
fruit and by their temple. I'm looking around the enclosure and it looks like a few of them. It's quite sunny over there, but there's a few at the very far end. Um, we've only got five in total though. So five kings, 20 rock coppers, 100 gentoos. We're looking at about 125 penguins here at Edward Zoo overall in our colony. Hello. Excellent. There's, Sorry, I think oh, aye, there you go. Back. No, there was a wee glitch there, but we, we caught that there was 125 at the moment. So um, quite a good wee population you've got. It is. It is absolutely stupendous. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you for that question. Um, we have another one from Miss Stewart. Do penguins have teeth? And how do they manage to eat? <laughs> uh, they don't have really particularly teeth. So they've got their beak. What they do have, though, is uh, if you ever see a penguin's tongue, you'll see it's very spiky. Um, imagine the prickles of a hedgehog covering their tongue. And that all those spikes point backwards down their throat. And the idea is that when a penguin grabs a fish, they swallow it whole and they let it go down their throat. And the reason for those spikes on the tongue is that the spikes, because they're pointing down the throat, the fish can slide down the spikes quite easily. But if the fish tries to flap itself back up, the spikes stop it going back up the throat. It's a one-way system. The fish goes down to get digested, and uh, much later on, it gets pooped out. And that's what you can see these little white smears here are. Um, <laughs> penguins produce so much poop, uh, they can actually track the colonies in Antarctica uh, from space. They use satellites to uh, see where the colonies have been moving around because they leave so much poo behind them, it actually creates a smear over the ice caps you can see from space. It's beautiful. <laughs> no, it, it definitely sounds like it. And I do have to say, uh, penguins having a tongue and teeth is something I've never considered before. Um, <laughs> so that's a really good thought provoking question. And as you said, led us on to, to thinking about how <clears throat> penguins are tracked. And again, that's essential for conservation reasons. And, you know, again, for, for scientists to understand how and, and where penguins are living. Yeah, absolutely. Great question, thank you. So the next one is from Joy. Um, why do some penguins have long eyelashes? It's actually through Joy from Katie at Dingwall Primary School. So um, I think what you're meaning is sort of their crests. So they're not necessarily eyelashes, they're more like eyebrows, I like to think of it. Um, let's see if I can move over here just so we see this idea. So some of our penguins, like the rock copper, are called crested penguins. So they've got these long yellow feathers. They're not hairs, but they're long yellow feathers that come from their eyebrows. Now, there's a bit of debate as to what happened. There's quite a few penguins with these crests and they're all related to each other. At some stage, there would have just been one species of crested penguin and all the crested penguins, whether it's macaroni penguins, whether it's the rock coppers, um, they've all descended from this one original who got those yellow eyebrows. Why did it uh, evolve in the first place? Bit of debate. Um, it evolved features, adaptations like that usually happen for one of two reasons. Either it makes them more, uh, it makes them more able to survive predators um, those yellow eyebrows maybe worn off predators, I don't know. What's possibly more likely is the second reason why adaptations come about. Adaptations often come about if it makes you more attractive to the opposite sex. Um, Evolution is all about passing your genes on to the next generation. Um, as someone who has a rather unique little genetic mutation up here, I've got red hair. If I have lots of babies, there's more red hair in the next generation. For whatever reason, whatever a penguin originally got that mutation to have yellow eyebrows, they were probably quite attractive to the opposite sex. They had lots of babies and their babies inherited the same thing. And if that happens year on year, what we can see is that we get more and more yellow eyebrows in their uh, population until every single penguin after hundreds of years might have the same uh, mutation. We call that mutation fixed at that stage and it just ends up being what that penguin species looks like. But a little bit about evolution there, sorry. But uh, I, get, I get all excited with evolution. It is really fascinating, but it's most likely to help our rock coppers communicate, particularly during the breeding season. Um, but that is why they get those yellow crests and we get a wee bit of activity from the rock coppers on the other side as they're moving around. But our Gen 2s are a lot closer today. We do actually have a, muta a, a mutated penguin. Um, a penguin with a mutation, we have snowflake. If you do see a penguin with a light gray back here at Enrizu, you might see it today or on our, uh, on our live penguin cam. 
he's got a, a mutation called leukism, which means that he's just got one in the population, a population who has it, but it means he struggles to produce the black pigment melanin. So unlike all of our other penguins who have a black back, there's one penguin out here called Snowflake who's got a light grey back. He looks a bit different. Um, but actually, I think I just saw him splashing in the water down there, so we might not see him today. <laughs> As you said, you can keep an eye out for him on uh, Penguin Cam, and I think it's it's important to mention evolution as well because as a, a species, you know, it's it's good to understand um, how species did evolve so that we can continue to care for them. <laughs> We're getting a wee bit of penguin activity here, which is good. So we can hear them. Um, if Blair is still with us, we've got a question from Roan through Miss McDonald. How long have you had penguins at Edinburgh Zoo for? <laughs> so I'm wondering if her connection is running a little bit slow. Are you with us, Blair? Yeah, excellent. Can you, you can hear us okay? Great question. Sorry, I was breaking up there for a second. I am. Hopefully you can hear me. Yeah, we can yes. now. <laughs> Excellent. Sorry, I think it buffered for a second. Um, yes, so um, how long have we had uh, penguins at Edinburgh Zoo? Penguins were one of the very first species we brought into our zoo. So we opened back in 1913. I hope we can... <laughs> Sorry. We opened back in 1913. We brought in penguins a few years later. Um, so we've all had penguins almost from the very start here at Edinburgh Zoo. Um, we were actually the first zoo in the Northern Hemisphere to ever breed penguins in captivity. Oh, there we go. We have lost Blair for a few seconds, um, but please stick with us. We did lose connection for a few moments or so earlier on, but hopefully Blair will join us again. Uh, Blair was just talking about the history that Edinburgh Zoo does have with penguins. Um, he may well mention, I'm sorry if I'm stealing some of his chat, but they do have a penguin as part of their crest. Um, it went right back to the very early 1900s. Um, there we go. You're back with us, Blair. Hello. Sorry about that. Sorry, okay. I've moved position. Hopefully, hopefully we've got a bit more luck. Um, now, yeah, absolutely. When did we get penguins? We opened our zoo as a, as a charity back in 1913. We got penguins a couple of years later. Um, and actually, we were the first zoo in the world to breed penguins, in the Northern Hemisphere anyway. Um, um, first penguin chicks ever born in the, uh, in the captivity in the Northern Hemisphere back in 1919. So that happened 102 years ago. And we've been breeding them ever since. So penguins are a really important part of Edinburgh Zoo. It's actually why they're the logo of Edinburgh Zoo, because uh, they're a really big part of our history as, a, as an organisation. So we almost back since, uh, certainly since the uh, uh, 19-teens, uh, that's when we got our penguins in. Excellent. You can see stuff, quite a few of them in the water now as well, enjoying the sunshine. Oh yeah, it looks like they're absolutely enjoying this Friday morning. <laughs> Excellent stuff. So we'll continue with the questions um, from Mrs. Dixon. It's a primary one A class, and they would like to know why do penguins eat fish, and why do they live in cold places? Good question. I think, uh, let's think about why they eat, uh, why they eat fish. Um, so penguins are a species of bird. Um, at one stage, their ancestors would have been able to fly. But what you'll uh, find is that there's a huge amount of food in the oceans. There's a huge ecosystem underneath the waves. And long ago, penguins' ancestors discovered that actually there's more food in the water than there was on the land for them. So actually by diving into the water, much like modern day gannets, I suppose, um, diving into the water, getting her fish out and flying back up. Gannets do this, guillemots, puffins, lots of seabirds do this. Um, but of course, these seabirds can usually only swim around in the water for a short amount of time before they get too cold and before they need to come up to breathe. Over millions of years, penguins have evolved um, to actually swim all the time. Why fly when you can just swim around and catch fish better? So they became heavier, they became streamlined like a torpedo. Uh, they've also got lots of fat on their bodies to keep them warm in the water. And by doing that, it, mean, it meant that they were able to actually to hunt in the water better and catch more fish and survive better. It's not actually thought that penguins evolved in Antarctica. It's not thought that they evolved in cold places. Most likely they evolved in New Zealand. Um, 
which is actually a, a temperature fairly similar to here in Scotland. Um, it just so happens though, but because they go into the water and they got all their fat to keep them warm in the cold water, they got their thick, dense feathers to keep them warm in the cold water, that actually they're able to survive in some very cold places. And that's really useful for them. If you think about in Antarctica, it's so very, very cold and so very, very isolated. There are very few predators for penguins out there. And if there's one thing animals like, it's not being eaten. <laughs> so if you can find a nice remote island to have your babies on where there's no predators, it helps them to survive and they like it. So because they've got lots of insulation to help them in the water, they can breed on Antarctica and they love to do it because there's few predators. And it's the same reason why they choose these remote islands like Tristan da Cunha. There's no mammal predators, no foxes, no cats. Um, sometimes nowadays you'll find rats and mice and that's only because they've been put on the islands by humans as we've gone in our ships and taken them there. And that's creating issues for animals like penguins and albatrosses as well out on those remote islands in the South Atlantic. Excellent stuff. So yes, certainly it, you just touched on there, you know, human human behaviour impacting on these faraway ecosystems. But um, hopefully something COP26 coming to, to Scotland will be discussed. Um, we have another question in for um, St Constantine's Primary 6A. And they would like to know, have the hot summers in Scotland impacted on the penguins? Um, undoubtedly they do. I mean, we are noticing that the summers are becoming a bit longer. Um, of course, with climate change, though, um, it's not just about becoming hotter. The weather's becoming a bit more erratic. We get more storms. Um, sometimes for us, we do get a wee bit more rain. So it's not impacting us hugely here at Edinburgh Zoo. Um, <clears throat> what we do do, however, um, is we do make sure we support our penguins when it is hot. It's one of the reasons why actually providing this huge swimming pool is so important for the penguins. Technically, they don't need the pool to, to survive. I mean, we can provide the fish without a swimming pool, but penguins in the wild spend most of their lives in the water and we want them to express their natural behaviours. But it's also a great way for the penguins to be able to cool down. So if it does get too hot, if the skies become too blue, as you can see, our penguins can choose all to dive into the water and cool down that way. The only exception is the chicks. If they have chicks, and they have chicks over in that, in that nesting site over there, the chicks come out cute and fluffy. Um, their fluffy feathers are great at keeping the wind chill off. What they're not, though, is they're not waterproof. They don't get their waterproof feathers until they're about six months old. And that means for the first six months of life, the chicks can't go into the water to cool down. So what we do is over at the breeding site, we put on lots of... Uh, Lots of shade so that the penguins can go into the shade and out of the sun. But also we put on sprinklers sometimes just so that the penguins can help cool down. So um, as we have always done on hot days, we can help keep our penguins cool. And if we do continue to get more and more hot days, we might just have to use these measures more often. Um, but for the chicks particularly, um, when they're coming through Easter into the early summer and they've still got their fluffy non-waterproof feathers, we put the sprinklers on and we give them extra shade over there. And that's what we do to support the penguins when it gets too hot. Excellent stuff. I think probably doing what a lot of us did this summer, you know, dipping in the water when it did <laughs> get a little bit hot for us. Um, yeah. So it's excellent that, that that's all to hand for them. And um, we've got a question from Donard Primary School, Primary 5, would like to know, where do these penguins come from? Which I think you have touched on a little bit earlier as well. Yeah, absolutely. So in the wild, this species would be found in places like Tristan da Cunha, uh, South Georgia, the Falkland Islands. These are all island groups in the sort of South Atlantic, South Pacific, sometimes ocean as well. Um, but the actual individuals you see here, none of them were born in the wild. Um, every single one of them was born in captivity as part of a captive breeding programme. So we've been breeding penguins here at Enver Zoo since 1919. Around the world, zoos have been breeding penguins. And every chick that's born in a zoo either grows up and stays in that zoo or it moves away to another zoo to join a new colony and breed with penguins that it's not related to, for example. So all these penguins that you see here are part of a captive breeding program that's been going on for over a hundred years now to create the next generation of these species uh, safe from the threats that they're facing in the wild. So we don't take animals out of the wild as zoos anymore. Um, it's not the best thing for those species. What we do do is the animals that we do have in our care, we look after them, we make sure they've got good welfare, and we try and make sure that the population is big and strong um, because whilst this, species, uh, this population is safe that you see here, 
the wild, we're seeing huge issues. Uh, climate change is going to uh, be a massive factor in that in the future as well. Um, and one day, not these penguins, but their ancestors might have to be reintroduced into the wild to bring them back for extinction. We're seeing this happening with other examples of biodiversity where zoo raised animals are actually having to be re-released back into the wild to bring species back from extinction. Uh, animals like the Socorro dove, Parchula snails, um, it's even happened with Shavasky's horses in the past where these animals were extinct, there were none left in the wild but by re-releasing zoo stock, we've actually brought them back from extinction, um, which is one of the big roles of what zoos are trying to do. Basically, we're, we're safeguarding them from extinction by keeping a population safe, uh, even if the wild system goes wrong. And as we're seeing with global warming, the entire world's wild system is potentially going a little wrong just now. So it's a big worry. I think that's um, a good point to make. You know, we are absolutely loving seeing and hearing the penguins just, you know, living their best life at the moment. Um, but it is important work that's been done. Um, I believe it's the northern rockhopper species that's on the endangered list, which, um, you know, you have some of there. So absolutely essential work going on at the zoo. Absolutely. The um, With our rock hoppers, some of their populations have gone down by 90% in the last uh, 30 years. Um, so in just my lifetime, their population has gone from, let's say you saw 100,000 penguins on a beach one, uh, 30 years ago. This year, you'd see 10,000. There's been a massive drop uh, in their populations. And even then, our, rock, our uh, Gen 2s and our king penguins aren't endangered right now. I've been working here at Edinburgh Zoo uh, for seven years when I started we'd have seen that our koalas were least concerned, our snowy owls were least concerned. Today, they're both vulnerable. They're as endangered as our Indian rhinos. They're as endangered as the giant pandas. So just because something isn't endangered right now doesn't mean that things can't change very rapidly. The wildfires of Australia and koalas demonstrated just how quickly something can change. And those wildfires, of course, exacerbated by the issues of climate change and global warming. Yeah, and I think, again, something else you touched on there, um, these changes are kind of happening in our lifetimes. So it, it's not something that's happening, you know, in 100 years' time. It's, it's currently happening now. So it's important that we have all these schools on board today asking these questions and, and really getting a good understanding of what is going on. Yeah. Excellent. We have more questions, which is great to see. So Mr. McCoy has sent in a question from Primary 7B at Our Lady of Peace, and they would love to know, in fact, a good question after what we've just been chatting about, what we can do to protect penguins as a class? It's a great question. And now, I mean, as a class, of course, what you can do, you can, you can help fundraise, you can help support charities like ours or others which are out there helping animals in their natural habitat. We've got a project in the South Atlantic called Project Pinnaman, which is helping rock hoppers just now, for example. But there's lots of other organizations helping animals in the wild. But of course, conservation can help conserve the animals in the wild. It doesn't necessarily help solve the massive issue. And the massive issue, of course, uh, for these animals, as, many, as well as many others, is the root cause of climate change itself, which is human populations polluting. Now, in the past, we'd have said, you know, there's a huge focus on making sure we save energy and um, switch off lights as you leave rooms and um, make sure that you're not using too much electricity. I suppose now in Scotland, I'm not saying we can get complacent, we can't get wasteful, but there's been a huge drive to get Scotland's electric grid basically renewable. I think we're at plus 95% of our, uh, our electricity from the plugs is from green clean sources. So perhaps we don't need to feel quite as guilty about that. But there are other things which are massive contributors. Heating of our houses is still largely natural gas. Transport is still largely petrol and diesel. Now I'm not saying that there's not renewable solutions coming up soon, but until those renewable solutions come up, um, electric cars or um, electric heaters and houses, what we'll maybe need to think about is, you know, this winter, let's not chuck the heating on in the house immediately and start burning natural gas. Can we go a couple more months by just putting on some, uh, putting on some layers and jumpers? For transport, really questioning every time that you get in the car and start burning petrol. Is, a, is it a reason why you need to be in the car? Or could you walk it? Could you cycle it? Could you use public transport? So we maybe, as our sort of renewables have come on so much, 
and have actually made things so much better in the electric world, maybe we need to start, start shifting our focus from, you know, turning the TV off standby. Continue to do that, by all means. But if we're going to make a difference, it's that burning natural gas in our boilers in the houses and petrol in our cars, which are now to the massive contributors to us burning fossil fuels and contributing to climate change in our day-to-day -day life. Yeah, and I think certainly with having a lot of schools on board today, um, I know there's a lot of active travel plans. Um, and as long as it is safe for you to walk to school, um, I think, again, that's something that if you're able to, is probably makes a good a good change rather than jumping in the car, like you said. Um, not always, it's easier said than done sometimes, but certainly something that you can aim for. Excellent. Thank you so much. I think we have... We've got a question from Dingwall Primary School. Oh, this is quite a good one, actually, something we've not touched on. But how does a penguin sleep? And what and how do they drink? And I think that's from Ryan. Uh, fantastic question. I'm actually looking around. Strangely, there's very few penguins actually sleeping right now. Um, you'll see that they spend a lot of time standing up and they do get a certain amount of rest when they're not moving. Uh, but when they are sleeping, they tend to, to lie face down um, I say face down, they kind of put their chin and lay it on the, uh, on the uh, floor in front of them. So they lie flat on their front when they're properly sleeping. Um, and they'll usually do that throughout the day, but it looks like they're all, you know, up and at it this morning. So uh, quite unlike them. Uh, I think it's because they've been getting fed recently. You can see the keepers in there with their food. Um, so that's how they go about sleeping. In terms of drinking, um, because they're usually surrounded by, uh, by salt water, they actually get most of their liquid through their food. Um, so we have to remember that although we think about food as a solid thing, most foods that you'll eat actually has a large amount of liquid in it. It's got a large amount of water in it. And it's actually how our penguins get most of their their food. I've just seen actually, we're in the summer, but we've uh, we've just got a couple of flirty penguins over by the uh, the window in the far corner. Um, they just gave themselves a little bow. They bow together, by the way. If the bow, a boy bows to the girl, she bow, bows back. And it looks like they've gathered a little pile of pebbles. So even though they should have been making their nest back in Easter, they're uh, having a little nest building session in uh, in autumn. Confused little penguins. Oh. <laughs> there's, there's always one. Um, that's fine. <laughs> A wee autumn romance going on there. <laughs> so yeah, why not? Eh? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> we do have a question in um, through Mrs. Dixon. Um, how long can penguins breathe underwater? Cracking question. Um, it depends on the species. Uh, as you can see, um, all of our penguins are slightly different size. Our rock hoppers are a lot smaller than the the Gen twos, and the Gen twos are a lot smaller than the kings and each of them has different lung capacities. Um, what you'll find is that um, certainly they can all hold their breath underwater for, for several minutes um, at a time. Um, so we're seeing them hold their breath for a lot longer um, than humans can. And to put it in perspective, um, an emperor penguin, the biggest of all penguins, they've actually been sighted at uh, depths of over 500 meters down underwater. So they can swim in a single breath down half a kilometer and back up to the surface. Um, that is significantly deeper than the height of the Eiffel Tower, for example. Um, it is a huge depth in a single breath. And that's because those, uh, those emperor penguins will be able to sp uh, hold their breath for over 10 minutes, basically. Um, so the bigger the penguin, the bigger the lungs, but also what you'll see is they've got special adaptations. Their blood contains a lot more haemoglobin than ours. Haemoglobin is what binds oxygen, so by having more haemoglobin, they can hold more oxygen in their lungs. They also slow their heart rate when they're underwater, so they start to ration that oxygen. Slowing the heart rate means you use the oxygen less quickly, and their heart rate goes to about a quarter of what ours would be, um, or of what, sorry, not of ours, it goes to a quarter of what their heart rate is when they're on the surface. So whilst on the surface, their heart might be going da dun da dun da dun da dun when they're diving underwater, their heart rate goes da dun da dun So by slowing that, it helps them hold their breath for longer. So it's not all about storing the, uh, the air in their lungs. Their bodies are adapted to hold their breath. And of course, the longer they can hold their breath, the longer they can chase a fish for before they have to go up for air. 
Excellent stuff. Yeah, a, a quite in-depth answer there. So again, something I've not thought about. Um, we do have probably time for a, a couple more questions now. Um, this is through Miss Stewart. How fast can you swim? And that's from Daryl. Oh, fantastic. Um, you know what? I've got the perfect species to talk about with that. Our Gen 2 penguins, I might hold on here and see if there's any swim below us as we're here. Our Gen 2 penguins, though, they are the Can fastest of all types of penguin. There we go. They're the fastest of all types of penguin in the world, and they will swim at speeds of over 20 miles an hour. So that's faster than a car speeding through Edinburgh these days. I think one was clocked at 22 miles an hour. Uh, there are reports of them getting up towards 30 miles an hour as well, but um, far faster than a human can swim. And that's because they've got these former wings, which help to propel themselves through the water like, uh, like big old paddles. Uh, penguins always look like they're swimming, uh, they look like they're flying underwater because they use their former wings to beat uh, the water just like massive paddles and that helps them get at speeds of confirmed 22 miles an hour uh, but as I say unreported speeds of up to 30 miles an hour uh, for Gen 2 penguins the fastest of all penguins in the world I've just seen one of our king penguins in the water there as well they've oh, all wow. just dived in I think they know we're talking about them so they're showing off for them <laughs> Excellent stuff. We have got a question again from Ryan at Dingwall Primary. Um, oh, I think we've maybe spotted what they are doing to play, but in general, what do penguins do to play? So um, for play, they love going into the water, of course. In fact, they'll chase each other in the water. So often you'll see our penguins chasing each other, and as they chase, they jump out the water a bit like a dolphin. It's called porpoising. Um, so by jumping out the water, it's actually what they would do to escape their predators in the wild. They jump out of the water, it creates bubbles and splashing behind them and means that any leopard seal that chases them suddenly misses the penguin. Uh, but much like lots of play behaviours, play is all about practising the behaviours you'll need to survive as an adult. So here in the zoo, when they're playing at chasing each other, they porpoise just as exactly they would have to do in the wild to escape predators. Um, other things that they can do to play, we give them a lovely little water slide at the top you may be able to see. Uh, over here, they've got a beautiful waterfall, a diving board. Uh, they get lots of different, uh, uh, different elements. But of course, one of the big things is that they're social. They live in a group. So if you want to let your pe pe penguins play with each other, you keep them in a group. And by being social and sticking together, they can play with each other anytime they want, as well as any objects that we have in the enclosure for them. Oh, excellent. Well, you can definitely see that they are having fun, uh, enjoying themselves now. We have had such a great session and it's been wonderful having everyone log on today, but we do have one last question for you. Um, COP is arriving in Glasgow imminently and we're hoping that um, this is going to be a time of change uh, for our planet. And what do you hope COP26 can achieve? I mean, there are so many things which are potential to achieve with COP26. In terms of securing basically those commitments to get rid of greenhouse gases, to move towards renewable energy, not just in terms of the electrics, but of course also in heating of houses and in transport. Those are big commitments we'd like to see, of course. But I suppose what we'd also like to see from a conservationist point of view is more commitments to actually alleviate the stress on the natural habitat uh, that's being faced. What we see is that with climate change, we're hoping that we'll get commitments to counter the effects of climate change. But in the meantime, animals are still struggling and they're not just struggling with climate change. They're also struggling with, you know, habitat loss due to the increasing human population, hunting. And there's very little conservation in the world which actually goes through government funding. So I suppose from our point of view, what we'd really like to see is commitment from governments that this is something that we want to protect. We want to protect biodiversity. And it doesn't just fall on the individuals of the public who raise money for these charities, but actually the governments could possibly help charities around the world who are helping animals in their natural habitat to take the pressure off whilst climate change is actually putting the pressure right on these animals uh, all across the world. So that's what I'd like to see, uh, see discussed at COP26 personally, uh, because there's an awful lot of power that governments can do um, to help animals in their natural habitats. And to be fair, a lot of these governments aren't actually st uh, stepping up for the animals in their own countries or around the world either. Um, and we're at the risk of, a, of seeing a mass extinction 
and lovely, beautiful animals, unique biodiversity, has been lost in the last few years and will continue to be lost unless something serious is done about it. So that's what we'd like to see discussed um, as, as part of that climate change. No, excellent stuff. And as I said, it's, it's been great fun to see the penguins and to see them enjoying themselves. But time for change is coming and this hopefully will give us all a wee something else to think about as part of the bigger picture. So thank you so much, Blair, for showing us the penguins. Um, thank you so much for joining us at home and at school and wherever you're watching in the world. It's been a pleasure to join Blair and the penguins today. Um, we have a lot more coming up for our final day. And I believe you can also log on to the Edinburgh Zoo website for Penguin Cam if you want to see see them in action a little bit more. Um, if you do have a few moments, please fill in a survey that we have online via YouTube. That'll give us a chance to hear what you thought of today and hopefully shape future uh, festivals like this. Um, I've been Gillian. Uh, we are here at Glasgow Science Centre and thank you for joining us for today. We're curious about our planet. Thank you.